Well, hello, everyone. It's so nice to be here with you all today. My name is Jen DePauli, and as it said, I'm a senior researcher at the Learning Policy Institute. We appreciate you taking the time to attend today's webinar. This webinar presented in co-sponsorship with AASA, the Superintendents Association, the Sold Alliance, and CASEL is the third in our six-part series on transforming state education policy through a whole child approach. The series draws on the Whole Child Policy Toolkit, an interactive website which provides a framework for state whole child policy. You can find the toolkit at the link in the chat, which we drop there shortly. Within it, you will find research, policy actions states can take, state policy examples, and resources across five areas. Today, we're going to focus on the second element in the toolkit, transforming learning environments. From the science of learning and development, we know that the brain develops as a function of relationships and experiences. So we need to ensure that learning environments are safe and welcoming and designed to support strong, positive relationships. State policymakers can take several actions to advance the transformation of learning settings, which we'll hear more about throughout this webinar. Um, but some of those include things like supporting relationship-centered schools, classrooms, and out-of-school programs, fostering safe and welcoming environments by prioritizing identity-safe classrooms and culture-responsive curricula, replacing harsh zero-tolerance discipline policies with restorative practices that are trauma-informed and healing-focused, establishing integrated support systems such as community school models, and providing high quality expanded learning time opportunities, including high dosage tutoring and before and after uh, school and summer learning programs. Before we dive deeper into uh, the policy though, I want to introduce our presenter, Dr. Pamela Cantor, who will provide the latest science behind why whole, whole child school designs are so critically important. Um, Dr. Cantor is a physician, author, and thought leader on human potential, the science of learning and development, and educational equity. Dr. Cantor practiced child and adolescent psychiatry for nearly two decades, specializing in trauma. In the aftermath of the 9-11 attack, she founded Turnaround for Children, which translates scientific insights into tools and services that help educators establish the conditions for all students to thrive. In two books published in 2021, Whole Child Development, Learning and Thriving, a Dynamic Systems Approach, and The Science of Learning and Development, Dr. Cantor crystallizes key scientific concepts about how human potential and learning unfold so that anyone seeking to open pathways for learning and opportunity for young people can do so. Dr. Cantor is a governing partner of the Science of Learning and Development Alliance, a member of the Brookings Institution's Task Force on Next Generation Community Schools, and a commissioner of the Learning 2025 Commission of the American Association of School Superintendents. She received an MD from Cornell University, a BA from Sarah Lawrence College, and was a visiting scholar at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And with that, I would like to pass it over to Pam. Very excited for your presentation. Oh, and I see you're on mute, Pam. I was thanking you for such an extraordinarily generous introduction. I and apologize for the hoarseness, so hopefully it won't be distracting. You know, when we think about somebody like Serena Williams, how did she become Serena Williams? Or Mae Jemison? How did she become the first black female astronaut? How does each of us become who we become? The passion to understand this has animated my life and work. And it all began in med school. I wasn't destined for med school. I had known trauma as a child. I was sexually abused by an uncle and my parents couldn't face it. But I did have this one person, a psychiatrist, who saw me in a completely different way. He told me I was a pearl in an oyster. Not this ugly, dirty thing that I thought I was. So you can imagine the day I walked into his office and I told him, I'm going to be a doctor. 
And he said, of course you are. And I thought, did he not know that to that point I'd been an art major? I had not taken any math or science courses. So my journey into medicine began then with GED classes and pre-med courses. It was a mountain of prerequisites, but even with the hurdles, I did well, enough to be waitlisted at 11 schools and accepted at one, Cornell University Med School. So 28 years old, I began. The night before that first day, I noticed something happening to my voice. First, some crackling as if I were getting a cold. That would be like what I have now. But then by late evening, my voice was gone, not laryngitis, gone. I was mute. I was up the entire night in a panic saying, I can't go. This is impossible. This is going to be totally humiliating. And in the early morning, I thought to myself, okay, I'll grab this clipboard and I wrote on it, I am Pam and I don't have a voice today. People who would become my classmates introduced themselves to me by writing on my clipboard. And as I sat down for that very first lecture, I looked around and I was struck. I was one of only a few women in my class. And yes, I was older than everybody else. I can't imagine what my classmates thought of me, that woman with the clipboard, but they didn't embarrass me. They helped me get through it. That night, I drove to my therapist's office. I couldn't call him because I had no voice. I had to see him. What is this? I wrote, pointing to my throat. He said it was a severe stress-induced reaction to the experience of that first day of med school. He took a pause and then he said, you still really don't believe that you belong here. He explained the power of stress to frighten, to shut us down, to ensure that we take no risks, to avoid feeling like an imposter and how powerful and excruciating that can be. These feelings, when you don't believe you're worthy of something, you don't believe you belong. Of course I asked, how long will it take to get my voice back? And he said, it takes two weeks to get used to anything new like this. Now I remember thinking he might be making that up, but I trusted him. And so I started counting down the days, going to class with my clipboard, feeling myself settle in. And yes, the voice came back in just under two weeks. So here are the two big things I learned from my therapist. I learned that trust is the antidote to stress. It is, it just melts it away. And that belonging would become the most powerful antidote to things like fear, including the fear of being seen as an imposter. I would come to learn the biology of all of this in med school. I also learned I wasn't alone in my feelings because one of my closest friends in my med school class was Mae Jemison. We shared many things, but by far, one of the most important was the question about whether we belonged. The reasons were surely different, but the feelings, they were exactly the same. So med school turned out to be this amazing universe where all kinds of mysteries were unpacked every day. The complex biologic mechanisms that explain all of the things that we're able to do. And it wasn't just the obvious things, like how our hearts and lungs work. It was how we love, how we attach, how we nurture, how we become conscious of ourselves and how we heal after things go wrong. So I'll never forget the moment in my med school lecture where I heard this. There are 20,000 genes in the human genome. And yet in our lifetimes, fewer than 10% will ever be expressed. 
So I remember thinking, well, what determines what's in that 10%? It's context, the environments, experiences, and relationships of our lives, the risks, but also the opportunities in development and learning sit inside this one profoundly important point that there is no separation between nature and nurture, biology and environment, brain and behavior, only a collaboration between them. Genes, I learned, are actually chemical followers. They're little packages of protein covered with receptors that are triggered into action by the environments and relationships of our lives. So this means that genes are not the drivers of who we become. Context drives the expression of our genes. And by context, we are speaking about relationships, like the one I had with my therapist, who taught me that trauma is not destiny. And the relationship that I had with classmates, including May, who always had my back, would never let me give up. This is about our families, our communities, our colleagues, our teachers, and our friends, and the safety and belonging we experience that pushes our own growth forward and helps us achieve the things that we dream of. Developmental and learning science tells an optimistic story about what's possible for all of us, especially our young people, because the human brain and our bodies and our abilities are malleable to experience because the brain is a dynamic living structure that's made up of tissue that is the most susceptible to change from experience of any tissue in the human body. And the brain is malleable over time. Most of its growth happens after we're born. So there are multiple opportunities to catch up along the way. This was surely my story. <clears throat> there are really just three things that I want you to remember about brain development. <clears throat> Sorry. The astounding malleability of the human brain, experience dependent growth, and the role of context. So, stress is the most common naturally occurring example of negative context. When we experience stress, Cortisol floods our bodies and our brains, and it's intense when it happens. In my case, this is what caused me to become mute the night before med school started. But if the stress is mild or tolerable, it's adaptive. It makes us alert and sharp, and it helps us prepare for an important event like a test or a performance. But the hormone cortisol can do a lot of damage to the structures of the limbic system, especially when they are young and still developing, because today we know that adversity doesn't just happen to children. It happens inside their brains and bodies through the biologic mechanism of stress. But that's not the end of the story. There is a big upside when we turn to the hormone oxytocin. Oxytocin is produced only one way human connection. This is the hormonal system that produces feelings of trust, love, safety, and belonging. It sets up the conditions for curiosity and exploration. This is the state where our minds open to possibility. It is a state of readiness to absorb something new like new learning, where creativity can blossom because we don't fear embarrassment or ostracism. It's a state where feedback is not only welcome because there is trust, we're drawn to it. We are drawn to it like we are to food when we're hungry or water when we're thirsty. We go toward it, we have to. This is what curiosity is. You have had it. Picture that state in your mind for a moment of wanting to know more and do more and be more. Chemically speaking, curiosity is most like a biological drive that is seeking satisfaction. It could be knowledge we're introduced to when we want more of it. It could be mastery of a skill 
and a coach helps us see that the goal we have is actually within reach. The chemical in charge of all of this is a neurotransmitter called dopamine. This is our dopamine pathway. It is our salience and reward pathway. And it is released when we are introduced to something that matters to us a lot, very often by someone who matters to us a lot. And we want more of it. We move toward it. We feel satisfied. We are rewarded for our curiosity. And then we want even more. Think about when you have been lost in a book and you have no idea where the time went. Think about a time when someone showed you something that you absolutely didn't believe you could do and then you did it. That feeling, it's a rush. It is the dopamine rush. Oxytocin sets up the conditions, the atmosphere where curiosity is possible, but it is dopamine that rewards us for our exploration. This cocktail, oxytocin and dopamine, is the cocktail we want to set up in our classrooms. So curiosity, engagement, and the fullest expression of a student's potential is possible. Oxytocin has many, many important aspects to it. It hits all the same structures in the brain as cortisol, but it's the more powerful hormone because it can literally protect children at the level of the cell from the damaging effects of cortisol. This is why the effects of trauma are reversible. I'm gonna say that a second time. This is why the effects of trauma are reversible. Not the events, but the feelings and emotions are. This is why trauma is not destiny. The message in the science is clear. We need a new design map to the way the brain grows and learns, a design that nurtures belief and confidence and provides for a fierce sense of belonging so no student settles for anything less than their highest aspiration, a design that combines positive developmental relationships, environments filled with safety and belonging, rich, meaningful learning experiences so students discover what they're capable of, the intentional development of the critical habits, skills, and mindsets that all successful learners have and integrated supports. My partner, Linda Darling Hammond and I, with Turnaround for Children, co-authored a playbook that Jen referred to, Design Principles for Schools, that goes into detail and shows how to operationalize these five core elements. It's filled with stories, elevating where this work is going on today and offering the tools and resources that would make this possible in any learning setting in any district. And with our collaborators, Karen Pittman and Marita Irby, there is actually a playbook using the same principles for out of school settings. So one final thought to leave you with. If a Mozart, a Martin Luther King or a Mae Jemison existed in a classroom designed the way many of our classrooms are still designed today, it's more than likely we wouldn't know they were there. We've not yet gotten to the right answers about human learning and human performance and unlocking human potential because we haven't been asking enough of the right questions. What are the forces that define the expression of human potential, the developmental range of individual performance? and the acquisition of competencies at higher and higher levels of performance, no matter where a person begins. What experiences and environments and relationships produce those kinds of results? How did I become me? How did May become May? It starts with this mind-blowing insight that context and relationships grow the brain, trigger the expression of our genes harness the brain's astonishing malleability to unleash the potential in each and every young person. For Mae Jemison, the sky was never the limit. It shouldn't be for anyone. Thank you all so much. I'm gonna turn it back to Jen. Thank you so much, Pam. That was incredibly powerful. And I 
would be remiss if I didn't say how important it is that we all keep that in mind as we're thinking about changing practice, practice and policy. Um, so I thank you again, Pam. Um, and as a reminder to everybody on the webinar, if you have any questions for Dr. Cantor, please drop them in the chat and she will do her best to answer them. Um, and now to take that more into the policy realm and what has been happening at the federal level to support these changes in schools, I'm gonna pass it over to our next presenter and the moderator of our panel today, Lakeisha Steele. Lakeisha is the Vice President of Policy at CASEL. Prior to joining CASEL, she was Deputy Assistant Secretary at the Department of Education. And prior to that, she worked for nearly 10 years in the US House and Senate, including most recently leading K-12 education policy on the Committee on Education and Labor for Chairman Bobby Scott. Lakeisha, we're so excited to have you. Um, take it away. Thank you so much, Jen, and thank you so much um, for the invitation to moderate and participate in this briefing um, with, with so many of you um, who have just been at the helm of doing this work. As I began this presentation, I, I started to just think about um, the history, you know, on how far the federal has, got, has come, you know, in shifting toward a whole child approach and education policy. And I first began by just starting from a place of how concentrated segregation leads to concentrated poverty, which leads to concentrated disadvantage, and which is reinforced in an equitable education system. And it's really the work of organizations like Turnaround for Children, the Learning Policy Institute, um, researchers like my colleague, um, Dr. Rob Jagers, who's gonna hate that I, I shouted him out, at Castle, who have really been at uh, the forefront with leaders um, that we're gonna hear from on this panel today, Dr. Gwen Warnament and Dr. Terry Lawler, who really have been at the forefront of the science of learning and development, really pushing our policymakers and working with our policymakers to understand what it takes to really mitigate that concentrated disadvantage that's in, that, that thrives in inequitable schools. And what does it truly take to ensure that our children not only thrive in schools, but also thrive in their lives? And so I think that going into this, this presentation on the federal policies that support whole child uh, education, it's really important to give credit where credit is due because policy does not happen in a vacuum. Change is certainly slow, but at some point the politics, and the policy and the people and the procedures that take that 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 are required to produce legislation that we're going to talk about today, they eventually align. But they align because of the hard work that is being done at the state level by our incredible leaders, by our researchers, and by organizations like LPI and Turnaround for Children. So I just want to say hat tip to you all um, and just the remarkable work that you have done in leading our country. Um, to creating this priority in federal, in federal policy and really expanding that federal role in education. So when we look at where Congress has come, and I didn't even take y'all back to 1965, we don't have that much time, but we're gonna start with ESEA. And we all know that the Elementary and Secondary Education Act was reauthorized as the Every Student Succeeds Act in 2015. And not only did the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, not only does it require states you know, to set academic standards, to measure student achievement, to develop state accountability systems. There is this focus on whole child education, you know, through measures of school quality and student success, through the authorization of grant programs, such as the Student Support and Academic Enrichment Grants and the authorization, you know, of grants like the full service community schools. And by the time we get to the end of this presentation, we're going to see the work that actually has been done to take a grant program that was authorized at 10 million and to see that that funding has increased to 140 million over the past five years. And so when we look at how states have been leveraging Elementary and Secondary Education Act to address systemic inequity and to focus on whole child education. These are some of the, the things that we're seeing happening, you know, including measures of school, school climate and SEL and state accountability systems, replacing exclusionary discipline practices with SEL supports and restorative justice, advancing whole child education as a school improvement strategy. And also we're seeing Title IV-A funding being used 
to ensure that focus on whole child supports. We also saw with the passage of the American Rescue Plan Act in March 21st of, of 2021 that Congress um, delivered this historic investment of $122 billion in K-12 education with a specific focus on academic recovery and social emotional learning. We know that states and districts are actually using these dollars to promote safe and healthy learning environments where children can, can thrive and really thinking about addressing those learning conditions for the success of students through their state and district plans. We also know that states are using ARP funds to support academic and SEL learning. And we will share some resources with you all today. Um, Castle um, has produced a report um, as well as uh, the chief state school officers has produced a report to really share how states are leveraging these policies uh, to really meet the academic and social emotional learning needs of our kids. We also saw that with the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, which was signed into law on June 25th, 2022, um, that, the, that Congress then commits again to whole child education with this $2 billion funding you know, focused around school safety and student mental health. There's also a prohibition on ESEA funds uh, to, uh, prohibit, pro to prohibit funding on dangerous weapons. Um, but this focus specifically around on, on producing this grant, um, funding for this grant at 1 billion so that states are able to meet uh, the, and think about what it takes to create safe learning environments in the conditions, again, that are required to do so. And that requires a focus on well-rounded education and safe and healthy students. And to know that these dollars went out by Title IV-A that we know that were already used uh, to produce and, and support whole child supports uh, it, it, it was, it's, it's, it's really um, a hat tip to Congress um, for this effort. We also saw that Congress provided in the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act this 50 million um, for after school programs. We saw this focus on mental health programs, this $1 billion investment. We also saw focus on around whole child supports in the Department of Education's guidance for the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. Um, there was quite a bit of funding um, specifically around the uses of funds for whole child education and particularly looking at social emotional learning supports. And in the FY23 omnibus that was just passed in December, we also see a continued bipartisan focus on SEL and whole child approaches. Remember at the beginning of this presentation, we talked about ESEA and specifically the authorization of the full service community schools. At that time, full service community schools were funded at $10 million. They are funded at $150 million today. We're also seeing continued investments in the education and innovation research grant program with specifically a set aside for social emotional learning research within those grants. Um, we're seeing the same focus around professional development and, the, and the, per, the, the, the importance of preparing our teachers for entering the classroom through these seed grants. We're also seeing the focus around promised neighborhoods and, the, and also our school safety national activities. And over the last three years through the, through the, the work of Chair DeLauro, the creation of, of this initiative um, has really led to a continued focus on hold child approaches and education. We're also seeing how far we've come with the increase in funding for Title I-A grants, which we know can be used for whole child education and SEL supports with an increase to 18.4 billion. And we also have seen uh, the Title IV-A grants, the Student Support and Academic Enrichment grants increase to 1.4 billion. And FY17, Title IV-A grants were funded at 400 million. And again, this is an example of the culmination of groups working together and the leadership of our, our state leaders um, to really get the attention of policymakers to educate them on the science of learning and development and what it takes for our children to be able to thrive in education and in their and throughout their lives. It's, it's through the work of you all that's really led to the culmination of, of these particular policies. And without further ado, we're going to go ahead and introduce um, our panelists so we can get into the conversation today. I'm going to introduce Gwen first. Um, Gwen, um, who is with us, um, doc, Dr. Gwen um, Warneman is with us. She's the director of the New Mexico Legislative Education S Study Committee. She has served public education for over two decades across the elementary to post-secondary landscape. 
A native New Mexican, she is passionate about elevating student voice and uplifting systems that both contribute to community health and enable school cultures to reflect deeper learning for students and adults. Most, pri most recently, uh, prior to her current role, she served as the Deputy Cabinet Secretary for Teaching, Learning, Assessment, and Policy at the Public Education Department and as Program Director for the Los Alamos National La Laboratory Foundation. A teacher at heart, Gwen is the mother of two wonderful young men and earned her PhD through New Mexico State University in Curriculum and Instruction with a focus on bilingual STEM education. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Dr. Warnament. And our next panelist uh, that I get to introduce is Dr. Terry Lawler. Dr. Terry Lawler is passionate about making equity of opportunity available to all students, regardless of zip code. Delaware's 2010 School Psychologist of the Year, Terry has spent her career translating research to practice in some of our state's most vulnerable school communities. In November 2018, Terry joined the Office of Equity and Innovation at the Delaware Department of Education. Under Terry's leadership, Delaware has achieved 100% trauma-sensitive status, institutionalizing self-care, and incorporating trauma awareness training into new employee onboarding. Outward-facing work includes establishing a trainer-to-trainer -trainer model, which has yielded a cohort of 234 school districts and youth-serving organization trainers, supporting school communities with a statewide compassionate schools learning collaborative focused on whole child development. Differentiating professional learning for educators and community partners from preschool to grade 12 on SEL, trauma, culturally responsive pedagogy, response, restorative practices, equitable and just schools, and mindfulness practices to reduce and eliminate the non-academic barriers to learning. This work provided the infrastructure for Delaware to be named one of the five trauma recovery demonstration project states with a $7.5 million award from the U.S. Department of Education. Terry was recently honored by the by Governor John Carney and Delaware Kids Count for leadership excellence. So we are definitely in the midst of uh, the most amazing state leaders who continue to, to really push our, our, our country forward with a focus on whole child development. And thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Lawler, welcome. Thank you so much. And so we can just go ahead and get into the conversation. So we just talked about uh, some of the federal policies that really have shifted toward this whole child education. Dr. Lawler, I will start with you. Um, and then Dr. Warnman, I would love for you to jump in, you know, just to share how your state has really leveraged these federal policies to focus on whole child education. And I think I, I, I probably already shared a bit of yours, Dr. Lawler, in, in your introduction. Oh, thank you. Uh, just a little bit. Uh, Delaware has transformed our learning environments with the whole child in mind by advocating for the collective humanity of all of our students and centering neuroscience and child development in all discussions on teaching and learning. We believe that attachment and belonging are at the core of safe, stable learning environments and that by having a highly qualified teacher in the front of the class, you have to begin by having a highly regulated adult who's available to co-regulate and share their calm to build strong relationships with students. It's in these interactions and the establishment of regular routines that trust is built in the classroom community and we cultivate the safety that provides that enabling context for learning. Our work began with pockets of innovation around 2014 that led to a groundswell of grassroots support resulting in Governor John Carney signing Executive Order 24 to make Delaware a trauma-informed state in October of 2018. Uh, months prior to that, Senator Margaret Rose Henry and our Lieutenant Governor's Behavioral Health Consortium supported comprehensive school discipline improvement plans that called out six strategies to improve school climate and culture that facilitated whole child development. And those six strategies were trauma-informed practices, social and emotional learning, culturally responsive pedagogy, equity, mindfulness-based stress reduction, and restorative practices. As a department, we have inventoried all of our whole child initiatives across the work groups to confirm that this is everybody's work. 
and that inventory ultimately motivated a revision to our NTSS regulation, Regulation 508, recognizing that while our tiered supports framework was the means to the end, the actual end was whole child development. Thank you for, for that, Dr. Lawler. Dr. Wadamek, can, can you share um, a bit about yeah. how your state has also leveraged these policies to focus on whole child education? Sure. Um, thank you first, Lakeisha, very much. And Dr. Lawler, um, it's quite a privilege to be on this panel with the both of you. <laughs> I feel very humbled. Um, um, and buenas tardes todos. Um, so I'm going to just talk actually a little bit about um, a fairly significant thing that happened in New Mexico in 2018. And, and that was a ruling by a district court judge. It was a sufficiency lawsuit um, that happened. And um, in New Mexico, what's a little bit different than um, several other states that have um, um, had sufficiency lawsuits happen to their state Department of Education um, is that the lawsuit also recognized that the students were not just um, not the state was not just meeting the um, failing to meet the needs of the students in terms of their education clause of the state constitution, but in addition, the due process clause. Um, and that was particularly um, important because it identified subgroups of students um, or groups of students our low socioeconomic um, students, our special education students, our English learners, um, and our Native American students were not um, receiving sufficient education. In addition, we also have these really wonderful education acts in New Mexico, a Hispanic Education Act, a Bilingual Multicultural Education Act, um, a Black Education Act, as well as um, a an Indian Education Act. And the ruling found that the state was failing to meet the needs of those acts. So as a consequence, um, at, through this lawsuit, and I think in addition, sort of the perfect timing of what was happening at the federal level, the state um, really thought deeply about funding as well as programmatic approaches that would sort of have this really sort of begin to transform or move the state in the direction of a whole child education, really grounded in what uh, we have defined as culturally and linguistically responsive education. And I'll hit on that later, but the term linguistically responsive is really fundamental, I think, in terms of the state and that whole child vision. And so, Dr. Barnabas, you really bring up an important, you know, point about the state role being how the state is constitutionally obligated, you know, to provide a quality education to students. And this lawsuit, you know, proved that the state wasn't sufficiently meeting these student needs. And then that propelled forward this focus on whole child education. Can you say a, a bit about how that change, how that shift to focus on meeting uh, the full needs of, of, of our children, how that actually has impacted student academic achievement and, and student well being, as well as the learning environments in schools? Sure. Um, I would, it's a difficult question because I think that. Um, we've had sort of this one-two punch in, as a state um, and potentially as a nation as well, or world for that matter, um, of already not meeting the needs of students and particularly in a culturally responsive, culturally sustainable way and a pandemic on top of that, right? And so with those two things, I think um, what you're asking Lakeisha is, have we then, do we see results and are we, you know, already there. And I would say the one thing that has come out of this, a silver lining, if you will, of really recognizing both of those fundamental impacts is that um, I believe policymakers in general, as well as the most critical stakeholders, students themselves, and then all of our administrators, our educa educator leaders, are, are fundamentally beginning to see that we need um, a systems lens, as well as a systems breakdown, right? And so something like a, this toolkit, um, this whole child vision is fundamental in order to really begin to then put together components around transformation. 
as opposed to sort of piecemealing transformation, which I think we've begun, we had we have inherited through the kind of our history and education. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Warnament. Dr. Lawler, uh, I, I, I would love for you to, to weigh in here. Under your leadership, Delaware has received, you know, 100% uh, trauma-sensitive status. You all received this trauma-sensitive uh, trauma recovery demonstration grant um, from the U.S. Department of Education. There really has been this intentional focus on whole child development. Can you share a, a bit about the changes that you're seeing in your schools and school districts and really what that impact has been on students. I think one of the biggest changes we've seen is that we've had to grow the work to be more resilience oriented and focus on student strengths and educator well being. Uh, we've also expanded professional learning to include not only our classroom educators but also anyone who works in our school community, as well as you serving partners, our out of school time providers, community-based organizations. Um, we've engaged caregivers and students in a variety of empathy interviews so that we can really hear what it feels like to be in our school environments. Uh, and then recognizing that, you know, if we wanna have physical, psychological, and emotional safety, it's gotta be more than what we say. Uh, so, um, and I think we've had to work very deeply and intentionally with our partners, and that includes our other state youth serving agencies, to make sure that we are all uh, working from the same and uh, speaking from the same lens, but also being really efficient in how we uh, share and deploy resources. Uh, you know, so we're not uh, working separately and uh, fragmentedly, you can't have whole children with fragmented supports. We really have to work together. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Lawler. So I, I really want to begin this next question with you, Dr. Warnament. We have a, a question um, in the chat that I'll just place in this context. You know, so within our education system, we know that we are, have a public education system that's serving 50 million children. The majority of, of those children are, are low income and they are also children of color. Um, we saw this focus, intentional focus at the federal level with the reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act to, it, to make sure uh, that subgroups of students are counted in state accountability systems and that we're thinking about what it takes to ensure um, the success of subgroups of students. Um, and with that said, um, there's a question in the chat about how does whole child education support our students of color? Um, so just thinking about our Black and Latinx and our Indigenous students, um, can you um, can you uh, share a, a bit about what that looks like in in your in your state, Dr. Warnament? Sure, thank you. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, two of the particular um, policy strategies that are found under transforming learning environments in this toolkit. Um, um, just in, I think having both Dr. Lawler and I on the panel is really a nice, beautiful um, duo because Dr. Lawler's strength is going to be a little different from mine. Um, so in terms of the uh, fourth and fifth of uh, learning, um, transforming learning environments, those strategies, one is around integrated um, support systems and the other is about expanding learning time and what that looks like. So I think in reference to what you're asking, Lakeisha, um, great question. Um, how does that impact and um, in what way do we um, really engage and or impact our students who are Latinx, Latino, Latina, um, as well as our Black students, or, um, as well as our Indigenous students? It's really about centering them in particular policy strategies. So I'm going to give you a couple of um, examples. Um, the first is, as we begin to look at how to particularly transform high school and the high school experience, um, and again, this is sort of integrated support systems as well as expanding learning time and really acknowledging what learning time is for those students. What does that mean for those students? And how are the particular, like even nuanced strategies around high school um, allowing them to shine and therefore all other students will shine, right? But um, in terms of high school graduation, what does it mean in terms of assessment for those particular students? 
And so in what way are the policies that we're doing um, allowing them to have voice in that space? And so a particular thing that I think the state has done in New Mexico is um, really embrace capstones as a process of um, breaking down sort of um, what we have traditionally seen as racist systems of assessment and, and barriers in graduation. So capstones have been a really beautiful space in that. I think we also have a an, an really wonderful socio-emotional learning framework that has been developed at the public education department. And we leaned heavily on students to engage them in developing that. We've heavily invested in community schools as a support um, system and um, there we now have a coalition community school act as well as a coalition at the, at the state level so em embracing students in that work as well um, so that there's broad stakeholders um, really building these systems and and that's really what we're doing is sort of building systems from the ground up as well as acknowledging systems that have traditionally um, proved as barriers for these students um, and then last i'll just sort of finish with this um, this notion of equity councils, which is also sort of a targeted um, strategy across the state that all districts are now engaging in that allow for voice from students as well as um, um, community members to really center those student groups. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Wanamed. Dr. Lawler, you said so eloquently that we can't have whole children with fragmented children. Um, so can you say a bit about what whole child education means for Black and Latino students in your state, as well as other students of color? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. I, I think uh, what it means is, uh, one, a change in how we view our systems of support uh, and expanding, sort of uh, redesigning those systems of support to be student-centered and meet student needs and not necessarily um, what is convenient uh, or uh, prudent for our education systems. We have tried to be uh, really expansive in aligning supports across uh, a continuum from uh, physical health to emotional and behavioral health. We've also uh, worked really hard to go directly to our customers, to, uh, youth and families, caregivers, so that we can hear where we are not missing or making the mark and uh, collaborating authentically in ways that really will meet their needs. We've expanded our uh, CTE programs even to include middle years so that we are deepening supports in systemic ways, but also making sure that uh, youth from the elementary or primary grades through secondary are thinking um, about the uh, power of their educations and then be also being empowered to make decisions that will benefit them, not just in school, but across the community. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Lawler. You, you really hit on the next question. You really discussed the importance you know, of making sure that you are engaging with the youth, engaging with our families and, and our caregivers. Can you share a, a, a bit about what that has looked like for you and what that, what that value add has been you know, in leading to these policy outcomes? What's been really awesome, I think, is that these listening sessions haven't just taken place uh, in the walls of our SEA. Our state board has gotten engaged, our first lady has gotten engaged, and all of our youth serving agencies. Uh, our state has a family services cabinet council where all of the uh, work to support children and youth in state agencies. Those uh, leaders meet regularly. We are collaborating regularly, uh, not just around human capital, but also funding resources. And uh, in that work, we've spent about 18 months listening to students about what it feels like to walk in their shoes, not just in our school communities, but in our larger communities. We know that uh, if, you know, if we want whole children, we need thriving families, we need resilient communities. So this isn't just the work of the school. Uh, with that in mind, we've tried to partner broadly 
uh, with any and all of our state agencies, but any partner that's invested in this work so that we can build the systems of care that are gonna wrap supports around young people in the places where they live, work, and play. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Dr. Lawler. Dr. Warneman, um, I, wow, I can't believe that so much time has already gone by and we're already close to 4 p.m. Um, but I, I, this is such a great question, so many great questions in the chat. And we only have five minutes remaining, um, but can you share one piece of advice that you would give to a superintendent to embrace this work? Um, there's, you know, the question is really just about disrupting the status quo, this, disrupting the status quo and, you know, just really figuring out how to gain this buy-in to focus on whole child education. Sure, um, it's a beautiful question. Um, I think that, um, You know the the word voice, um, Lakeisha, and your wonderful like um, acknowledgement. The word voice is really critical and um, something that I return to again and again and again. And it's not so much in terms of your own voice; it's a um, shared voice, and it's um, a really fundamental piece. I think that links. Um, all of these pieces together because that that is actually how you begin to recognize and see one another. That is how you build relationships that Dr. Cantor was talking so eloquently about. Um, that is how people develop agency. Um, voice is a really fundamental piece of how we do this work. And Dr. Lawler has a great example that she just shared with you in terms of what happened in Delaware. And I believe that's what's slowly happening in New Mexico. Um, but fundamentally, what does it look like if you're going to change an assessment system in the state? What does it look like if you're going to change um, a teacher evaluation system in a state? What does it look like if you're going to um, create a, a, a council or a task force to actually set a vision for the state, right? Um, really fundamentally recognizing voice of those who are most impacted and centering them is maybe the most important thing that you could do and moving outside of your own space for that voice so that you're not just expecting voice to come to you, but you're actually going to the community and honoring their voice in their space and seeing who they are and valuing that for them themselves. And I think in that way, um, I would also say that's why a culturally and linguistically sustainable education is maybe one of the most important pieces of a whole child education. May I add to that? Yes, please. That it looks like a growth model, that even in our um, evaluation systems, we're focusing on capacity building and educator growth as opposed to just uh, you know, looking at performance in the classroom or tying it uh, directly to instructional prowess. And we've shifted our conversations to uh, talk less about buy-in and more about commitment because these are not strategies that are gonna take place overnight. But if you're really invested in making a change and seeing a change, that we have to commit to this whole child design, not just uh, you know in the short run, but for the long haul. I think that that's just a really beautiful way, Dr. Lawler, to end this panel discussion, which honestly, I could talk to you and Dr. Warnament forever, uh, but thank you so much for that. Um, for le leaving us with Dr. Warnament, leading us with the importance of voice and recognizing that value and creating relationships, building community, but also but also agency. And Dr. Laura, thank you for leading us, leaving us with it's not about buy-in, it's about a commitment to whole child education. And so thank you both for your leadership. Thank you for your commitment to whole child education. And thank you so much for, for moving our country forward and for just making sure that our kids are getting what they need to succeed and thrive in school and in life. And with that, I will kick it over back over to Jen. Thank you, Lakeisha. And thank you to Terry and Gwen. Lakeisha, I couldn't have said it better, so I'm not going to. Um, that was a really ins insightful and inspiring conversation. And I want to thank Pam, uh, Dr. Pam Cantor again, for sharing her knowledge and expertise. That was such a powerful presentation. 
Um, and thank you to our co-sponsors, um, AASA, Castle, and the Sold Alliance. As I said earlier, today's webinar is the third in a six-part series on transforming state education policy through a whole child approach. A recording of this webinar and the PowerPoint slides will be made available shortly and they will live on our website if you ever need to find them. Uh, our next webinar on March 1st will explore how we can build adult capacity and expertise for whole child education and how states are working to support these shifts. Uh, and in the chat, you'll find a link to learn more about the entire series and register for, register for the next webinar. Um, before you leave, we'd appreciate if you could take a minute to complete the survey in the chat. I'd like to thank you all for attending and we hope to see you in March.